All right. Well, perfect. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank all of you so much today for taking the time and tuning in to all of our project updates over here. Um, as you can see, my PhD project is more focused on the sync side of things with regards to the source to sync project. And today, particularly, I'd like to focus more on uh, trying to take a closer look at the geochemical constraints on particularly gold mineralization, more specifically origin of gold mineralization between the area of Malartic and Valdor of the southern Abitibi sub-province. First things first, though, I really want to take the opportunity over here and thank all of our partners that are involved, not only with the Metal Earth Project, but also all of our industry partners as well as partners at other academic uh, institutions, of which, as you can see, there are a lot. So uh, thank all of you for always taking the time, the effort, and all your work to help me progress, and uh, greatly appreciate it at this point. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping of what I'm going to talk about over the next couple of minutes. So my PhD project is by and large composed of three separate blocks. The first block has tried to better understand the timing of gold mineralization at the CAM scale. And we've already touched on that quite a bit and excessively during previous Middle Earth board meetings. And then I'd like to touch on the second major part that tries to better characterize gold precipitation mechanisms and fluid sources, with in particular emphasis on multiple sulfur isotopes and sulfate trace elements. And last but not least, I want to touch on a smaller minor part of our project that tries to uh, take a closer look at the potential of hydrothermal remobilization of polymetallic inclusions where we've acquired some preliminary TM data as of now. Uh, let's just get ourselves situated within the Malartic Baldur camp over here real quick. Uh, I don't want to take a deep dive over here, just real quick. You can see the fairly colorful units in the northern half of our map over here that comprise the east-west more or less sub-vertical metavolcanic rocks of the Abitibi sub-province hosting the gold mineralization for the most part. And in the southern half, the more uniform blue color comprise our meta sedimentary rocks of the Pontic sub-province. And we have then the mostly famous dividing structure, the Larder Lake Cadillac Faults in the hash pattern over here, dividing these two sub-provinces of the superior kratom. There's also a little metamorphic great difference and gradient in the sense that the Abitibi sub-province is mostly characterized by green schist metamorphic grade. And the Pontic sub-province a little bit higher metamorphic grades of upper green schist to antibiotic metamorphic grades as shown by the isograts over here. What we've also indicated over here are the nine different ore bodies that we are fortunate enough to have received samples from to work with. And these nine different ore bodies we can by and large um, characterize into four different mineralization styles in space and time during an orogenic cycle. So we have a more synvolcanic dominated subtle copper gold mineralization that's developed in the area. And we have a pre-D2 highly deformed quartz carbonate main set that hosts gold in the area. And whenever you see the term D2 during this presentation, I want you to keep in mind that this refers to the major north to south shortening event that has developed this pervasive east-west trending S2 regional foliation that we term S2 for this presentation over here. During this north to south shortening event, we also um, form and initiate a disseminated stock work in and around the township of Malartic, as well as during sin peak shortening conditions, we also generate our infamous quartz tourmaline carbonate veins that are the textbook picture perfect example of orogenic gold mineralization globally. And those are the veins that I want to take a deeper and closer look at during this talk today. So let's just take a look at an outcrop example over here of quartz tourmaline carbonate veins. So we find ourselves at the triangle deposit at an underground slope. We're facing to the west and we keep in mind that we have our slight by and large east-west trending regional foliation schematically indicated over here. And sub-parallel to oblique, we have the initiation during our major north to south shortening event of these quartz tourmaline carbonate weaver shears, which are, as you can see, neater white laminated shear veins that host fine large pyrite with minor base metals and gold, in this case, up to 7 ppm, for example, over here. And what we've tried to do um, with the first part of the project is try to better characterize the time of gold deposition precipitation in the area. So this is one of the final figures of our manuscript that's already been submitted, where we've tried to um, characterize gold mineralization in time. And we were able to not only take quartz carbonate mineralization in the highly deformed quartz carbonate vein set, but more specifically the origin of gold mineralization within our quartz tourmaline carbonate vein set. And then on top of that, we were also able to pull apart a separate hydrothermal overprint that has affected largely the quartz tourmaline carbonate veins. And 
And as you can see here, we have um, just in comparison our previously reported TIMS ages, which are highly accurate and highly precise for the area. But we hope we, we hope that we make a compelling case for short-lived hydrothermal events in the manuscript. And just to emphasize that a little more, we have the final plots um, of our uranium xenotheme data. So we were able to date a total of 85 xenotheme's. And we get the following results. So for our quartz carbonate veins, we get around 2686 million years. And then for our quartz thermal and carbonate veins, we get major time of gold mineralization at around 2643 million years. Now, when I say syn gold mineralization over here, I want you to keep in mind that we speak about xenotheme's that are either in textual equilibrium with um, gold hosting sulfites or occur as sulfate mineral inclusions within homogeneous pyrite domains of our gold hosting sulfites. And those are also characterized by a slightly enriched medium rare earth element content, in other words, enriched neodymium and samarium contents, as opposed to our post gold mineralization event, which is largely characterized by xenotheme's that are in textual disequilibrium, so they replace sulfate mineral hosting gold or overgrow them, as well as show depleted samarium and neodymium contents. And we were able to pull apart a hydrothermal overprint event affecting gold mobility, uh, gold primary gold mineralization at 2607 million years. Having said that, I want to leave the in-situ uranium bed geochronology story over here. So we were able to date with CHEF together on the laser 85 xenotheme's, and that work's already been fortunately submitted to mineral and deposita in mid-March. Which brings me to the second major block of my PhD thesis, which tries to better characterize the geochemical constraints of gold mineralization at the CAM scale. And I want to start out with trying to uh, just take a closer look at multiple sulfur isotopes and a sense of why we actually do multiple sulfur isotope analyses in the first place. Because with the recent advent of um, in situ analytical techniques and major advances with regards to analytical techniques, it turns out that the delta 34 sulfur signature that we um, can observe within sulfate minerals is actually more characteristic of physical chemical processes that happen during the time of sulfate formation within the hydrothermal fluid. And it's particularly within the Archean eon that we can observe um, mass independent fractionation, which is then reflected with, largely reflected within our capital 33 delta sulfur, as well as capital 36 sulfur compositions. And therefore can be um, used to decipher the initial primary source of our sulfur. And why do we focus on sulfur so much? That's for the simple fact that sulfur is, especially within an orogenic gold environment, one of the single key gold transporting ligands within an auriferous fluid. And therefore, we're hoping by combining these three signatures together with trace element signatures of our key sulfate assemblages to get a better understanding of gold precipitation mechanisms at the mineral grain scale, as well as to maybe elucidate uh, some of the sulfur reservoirs associated with our hydrothermal fluids. And I want to stick with our quartz thermal and carbonate veins over here by the example for it at, at, within our gold export buddy. And I just want you to uh, keep in mind that these quartz thermal and carbonate veins are for the most part dominated by a pyrite assemblage. So we have major pyrite plus minus some base metals and then uh, as well as gold, gold within homogeneous rim domains for the most part, as well as polymetallic inclusions as we'll get to in a second. And what we're able to um, pull apart by using highly precise in situ analytical mm, techniques, such as for example, the SIMS, uh, where we can do spot analyses in situ similar to the laser, we can just analyze different textural domains of sulfate minerals, as for example shown over here, where we have an older core that's, host, um, that's hosting a lot of silicate and tourmaline inclusions in Goldex, and then we go into a more homogeneous rim area, which then also holds small micro to nanometer scale uh, sized polymetallic inclusions, as you'll see in a second. What I want you to take away from this slide is that we have, by going from our core domain into our rim domain, a very narrow range in delta 34 sulfur, which means that we have a slightly lighter core domain versus a slightly more enriched, heavier rim domain, all the while observing a slightly negative capital 33 um, sulfur signature. 
Um, just an example of our sulfate trace element maps that we've done, that we were fortunate enough to acquire at UCAC in Shikurimi at their brand new time of flight laser, which is a really powerful machine and acquires a bazillion of different isotopes and analytes at the same time. Um, and we're looking over here at gold, silver, tellurium, and bismuth in the exact same sulfur brain that we've just looked at. So we have our tourmaline inclusions over here. And what I want you, what I just want to stress first is that we always got to be careful with these false color EDS anom or concentration anomalies, because in the case over here, we seem to have, um, when we go back to our reflected light images, an anomaly that doesn't even exist. So there seem to be some interferences that could have happened in our analytical artifacts by and large. Um, so we can just uh, neglect these anomalies. But when we look in the homogeneous rim area of our pirate again, we see reasonable overlaps with reasonable concentrations in silver, tellurium, bismuth, and gold as well, meaning that we have a small polymetallic inclusion present um, in this homogeneous rim area. And what I want to stress over here is that we're still acquiring more laser data. However, uh, one key difference to other orogenic gold systems, for example, the Yolgarn, is already that we observe really low arsenic concentrations. They're all well below 500 ppm. In contrast to the uh, Yolgarn craton, we have a lot of orogenic gold systems that host up to weight percent of arsenic in the pirates to um, even like arsenium pirate and arseno pirate for the most part that are being associated with gold precipitation. Uh, I want to come back now to our multiple sulfur isotope data set, where we are just looking at pyrite data in our quartz tourmaline carbonate veins. And what we're looking at over here are um, sulfur data within a delta 34 versus a capital 33 sulfur um, graph that is usually used to delineate between mass, uh, mass dependent fractionation within the sulfur isotopic system or mass independent fractionation of within the sulfur isotopic system that can be present particularly um, pronounced within the RT and Eon. And what we see over here are, um, is, are plots for our gold bearing pyrites. And it's a similar pattern to the one that we've observed in Goldex already. We always see a slightly depleted core with a slightly enriched rim area present in all the other ore bodies as well, which is again another major contrast to the Yilgarn pyrites and Arsenium pyrites, because in the Yilgarn we mostly observe a relatively speaking heavier core and then a lighter rim domain, which goes negative to like negative five, negative seven per million which means that we're talking about contrasting sulfide precipitation mechanisms. And we think that in contrast to urine, where people are talking a lot about fluid oxidation associated with uh, sulfide precipitation, we think that in the ABTB, we are talking more about um, a fluid desulfidation by and large that is responsible for these narrow, tightly constrained delta 34 sulfur um, in uh, over here, as you can see. And we also observe a slightly subtle constant negative uh, capital 33 sulfur signature as well, which is again another major contrast to the Yogurn because in the Yogurn we see quite the mirrored image of slightly positive capital 33 uh, sulfur associated with gold mineralization. That already brings me to the last part of the project where we're looking at uh, polymetallic inclusions at the nanometer scale in more detail because um, we've now learned make first interpretation that uh, sulfates precipitate by fluid desulfidation, therefore destabilizing our gold complexes in the fluid. And with this part of the project, we're interested in whether or not there might be other additional processes that are involved with the formation and precipitation of gold at the nanometer scale. And particularly because there's been um, more publications that came up in the last two years that have dealt with polymetallic inclusions again where people have um, looked at the polymetallic melt model again, where they're talking about bismuth scavenging gold from a hydrothermal fluid. We're also just talking about tellurium rich hydrothermal fluids associated with gold mineralization. And what we're particularly interested in is the hydrothermal remobilization of polymetallic inclusions, as you'll see in a second, because we always observe um, a large spatial displacement of um, polymetallic assemblages from inclusions into these late sulfate fractures and there could therefore potentially modify and shape gold mineralization. So um, this is just a prime example of what these polymetallic inclusions look like. So we always start out with the gold rich part in our inclusion. The most prominent tellurite species are calaverite and petzite, and then always to some degree smaller bismuth tellurium associated with them. And we know from our Xeno team geochronology that these inclusions for the most part form in and around the time of 26 million years 
And the hydrothermal overprint that's been dated is at 26 or 7 million years, and we hope that we get a better understanding of go precipitation and displacement mechanisms by looking at that part. Let's just take um, a, a bigger scale of the exact same polymetallic inclusion where we have our pyrite core over here, which is slightly um, depleted in delta 34s, as we've learned. We've got our rim domain, which is slightly enriched in delta 34. And within the homogeneous rim domain, we have our polymetallic inclusion. And then we also observe commonly within our quartz and carbonate veins within the sulfates, these late stage sulfate factors. Um, along which we observe a lot of these similar polymetallic assemblages. And I just want to take a look at some preliminary TEM data over here, in a sense that we were able to get a TEM fall over here, going through an initial inclusion. This is the TEM cross-section and profile over here, where I just want to point out that we have a perfectly homogeneous sharp contact between the pirate host as well as the polymetallic assemblage, which is in a stark contrast to when we look at a quote unquote texture late sulfate fracture going through a pyrite in Goldex over here where we have a texture late calcite main that, that's infilled with tellurium bismuth as well as gold silver fragments and where we were able to get a foil going across over here. So your pyrite host is on the left hand side in the TM cross section also highlighted in here and we got a completely different picture of like sub angular fragments that are just dragged along within this texture late fracture and not only that we also observe amorphous carbon with as interstitial infill and voids over here which is highly interesting and just going a little into more detail in this area for example we also observe a pitted texture within our bismuth tellurium assemblage as well as bismuth tellurium nanoparticles that are actually uh, associated with our amorphous carbon phase over here. That's an abstract that we've submitted for SEG already. And there's also more TM data to come. So having said all of that, I want to finish with this slide. I hope that we're making a compelling argument for um, multiple short-lived hydrothermal events that are responsible for the formation of orogenic code time scale. It's a manuscript which has already been submitted to Mineral Deposita last month. Uh, and then we got to make investigate our multiple sulfur and trace isotopes and trace element data sets in more detail. However, we can already make some first preliminary um, interpretations with regards to our quartz and carbonate vein set. There is still more laser data to come, but we are hopeful that we can submit a manuscript later this year dealing with these two major blocks. And last but not least, we're talking about polymetallic inclusions. And we're interested in those because there seems to be a significant fundamental difference to a lot of the orogenic gold systems in other parts of the world. And we're also looking in more detail at more TM data, which will hopefully be another manuscript early next year.